It's a famous story about how Venerable Ananda gained awakening. He'd been invited to the First Council because he had listened in on more of the Buddhist talks and remembered more of the Buddhist talks than anybody else. But unlike the other members of the Council, he was not yet an Arahant. So on the night before the Council was to meet, he was meditating really hard. He wanted to be an Arahant, just like the rest of them. Yeah. They had been dropping a few comments about how it would be a shame if he were still just a stream matter when attending the conference, attending the Council. And so he was meditating really hard, really hard, really hard, and finally he realized this just wasn't working. So he was going to call it a night. And just as he was about to lie down, he wasn't in a sitting posture, he wasn't in a, the lying down posture, he was halfway between. He finally gained awakening, full awakening. This is a very popular story, because the lesson seems to be if you want to awaken too much, it gets in the way. And it was the moment where, the, where Nanda gave up that desire. That was when he gained awakening. So the lesson would seem to be, if you just give up the desire for awakening, there you are. You don't have to work for it. You don't have to have any strong desires. Just let it happen. And there is a just letting it happen aspect to it, but also the Ananda wouldn't have gotten to that point if it hadn't been for the desire, hadn't been for the persistence and intent and powers of discrimination and discernment that he brought to the practice. If it hadn't been for them, he wouldn't have gotten to that point of equilibrium. Awakening doesn't just happen. You have to have the desire for it. We hear stories of spontaneous awakening. The question is, is it really awakening? Psychologists talk about what's called neurotic breakthroughs, where people have been struggling through a really dark period in their lives. And then for one reason or another, it snaps. And that really oppressive mind state, that really oppressive state of becoming that they had been maintaining had gotten so heavy and so unbearable and so unmaintainable that they just finally dropped it. experienced a great release. But the question is, what did they awaken to? When the Buddha awakened, he awakened to understandings about intention, action, cause and effect, skillfulness, lack of skill. And in the process of reaching the deathless, he really did have to take apart bit by bit by bit very subtle and very pleasant states of mind, very subtle mental activities. So they really understood what it was to act, what it was to condition something. So that when the genuine unconditioned came, he really knew that it was unconditioned. Because with neurotic breakthroughs, it's usually just another form of conditioning that, in contrast to where you were before, seems very bright and very light. It's like going from a very dark room into one that's extremely bright. And because you're so blinded by the light, you don't see any objects in the room. You think there's nothing there. It just has just incredible light. But you'd have to stay with it for a long time to begin to realize, as your eyes begin to adjust, oh, there are objects in the room. So this is one of the big paradoxes of the practice, is that we want to get to a state that's unfabricated, but you really do have to have strong intentions. There has to be a strong desire to get there. Desire is one of the elements of right effort. The formula for right effort always starts out generating desire. Desire is the first basis for success, or the basis for power. Concentration based on desire.
that the desire has to be coupled with wisdom. One, so that it's not too excessive in the sense of getting you all frazzled or too weak. And it has to be aimed at the causes, what you're doing to get there. Then the effort really does have to be directed at the right causes. Is that image in the canon of someone who's trying to milk a cow by twisting its horn. And I don't know how many times I've heard people say, well, I was trying really, really hard, and finally when I realized it was my trying hard that was making me all frazzled and stressed out, so I just stopped trying, and there I was, state of peace. Well, it's milking the cow by twisting its horn, finally realizing that twisting its horn you're just putting a lot of energy into it, and you're not getting anything out of it. Tormenting yourself, you're tormenting the cow. Wouldn't it be better to stop? Well, yes, it is better to stop, but you still don't get the milk. You've got to figure out which part of the cow to pull or twist. So that's what we're doing as we're meditating, is trying to find where is the right spot to focus your desire. And how do you encourage or how do you generate that desire? That's an important aspect of the path. Sometimes the Buddha encourages developing a sense of heedfulness, realizing that if you don't train the mind, you're in big trouble. And there are lots of passages in the canon where the Buddha has you ask yourself, are you ready? Do you realize the dangers that are out there? So that's the first way of sparking desire, is realizing that if you don't make progress on the path, if you don't give yourself over to training the mind, there's going to be a lot of suffering. At the very least, there's aging, illness, and death. There's war, social unrest, and there's a possibility that the, that the Buddhist teachings could be forgotten. There could be a possibility of, of split in the Sangha. And would you be able to dwell in ease if any of these things happened? And death, of course, is not necessarily far away. You don't know where you are in the line. So if it suddenly came up, would you be ready to drop everything and just say, okay, that's it, let go, without a lot of regret, without a lot of sticky attachments? And one of the biggest regrets is that you had the opportunity to practice and you didn't make the most of it. You dawdled through the practice. He said, well, I'll put it off till tomorrow, and I don't want to push myself too hard. And as a Mahabhava says, for many of us, the middle way is right in the middle of the pillow. So you don't want that regret. That's one way of stirring up a a sense of desire is realizing there are dangers out there, dangers in the mind, dangers outside, and of course the biggest dangers are the ones inside. Having a mind you can't really trust. We like to think that we're kind, generous, harmless people. But if society really did break down, or what the Buddha called a sword interval came. People started hunting one another down. Can you trust yourself that you would do the right thing, that you would maintain your precepts? And if you can't, that's pretty scary. You've got work to do. Because the scariest thing in the world is a mind that you, your own mind is something you can't trust. Another way of sparking desire is through developing a sense of sangwega, just thinking of the long wandering on that wanders kind of around and stops here and then turns right and turns left and turns right again and just keeps wandering in pretty aimless circles. 
than all the suffering involved, both for you and on, for the people that you have to depend on. One of the reasons we have that reflection on the requisites is to remind ourselves that simply by being born as a human being with a human body, you've got these big gaping needs. Food, clothing, shelter, medicine. And when you start out, your parents have to find these things for you. And as you grow up, you have to find them. And it involves a burden on others. Some people like to think, well, I'm going to be a bodhisattva and I'll just keep coming back and doing good, doing good, doing good, and I won't be selfish to, so selfish as to stop coming back. But each time you come back, there's a huge debt. There's a huge weight you place on other people, other beings. This is one of the reasons why the Buddha has us develop a sense of gratitude as well, to think of all the good that people have done, the simple fact that we're here alive has meant that people have had to make choices where they had to sacrifice, starting with our parents. They had to make lots of sacrifices for us. And then on through other people who had to go out of their way so that we could survive, we could learn, we could understand what it is to be a good person, a person of integrity. That's something you want to keep in mind as well, that you've got some debts. The Buddha said the only person who's totally debt-free is an arahant. So we have the debts we have to repay. If you keep coming back again and again and again, it's just building up more debts. So the Buddha has you keep that in mind. There's an interesting connection between gratitude and mindfulness. The word gratitude means, literally in Pali, it means knowing what was done. And mindfulness is something the Buddha defines as the ability to remember what was done both things you've done and other people have done for you. It's that ability to remember, that ability to appreciate what was done. It's an important motivation for the practice. At the same time, it's part of the skill that you have to develop in order to get the right perspective on things as to what's skillful and what's not. So that's another way of sparking desire. And there's the positive side, the positive things that come with the practice, realizing that this is a precious dharma that we have to practice here. We read about those who've gained awakening, the happiness they tell of, a sense of freedom, release. And this is a legitimate way of motivating your practice is to want to gain that release as well. Sometimes they say the Buddha doesn't talk about nirvana that much. He actually has a lot to say about how good it is. What he doesn't do is to define it or try to pin it down in words because it can't be pinned down. It's a long string of adjectives, long strings of imagery that he uses to give the sense that it's secure, free. Absolute happiness, totally beyond any kind of danger at all. The third way of generating desire is, is to develop a sense of shame. One of the more unusual passages in the canon is where the Buddha talks about three governing principles in the practice. When you feel tempted to slack off. And the first two relate to the themes we've already discussed. One is the dangers of slacking off. Realizing here you have come, you've learned of a path that leads to true freedom, and now you're going to go falling back for a lesser happiness. Do you really love yourself if that's the way you act? That's to develop a sense of the danger of slacking off. The second governing principle is an appreciation of the Dharma. This is a wonderful Dharma we've got here, taught by someone totally free from greed, aversion, and delusion, timeless. A 
points to the positive aspect of the practice. Then the third one is, the third governing principle is the world. This is the unusual one. The Buddha says that there are people in the world who can read minds. How would you feel if they were reading your mind right now? Wouldn't you be ashamed? Or if they were watching your life, wouldn't you be proud that someone is watching and seeing all the wonderful things you do from moment to moment to moment, or would you be ashamed of the times that you slack off? So those are the three main ways the Buddha has is generate desire. One through a sense of heedfulness, or sangwega, realizing the dangers of not practicing. The second is through developing confidence, and seeing the positive things that do come from the practice. And third is a healthy sense of shame. Healthy in the sense that it builds on a sense of self-esteem. You wouldn't, wouldn't want to do anything that was beneath you. So an important part of the practice is learning how to generate desire in these ways, to figure out which one works for you. And train yourself so that you're quick to respond. Don't be the worst horse. You know, the, the Buddha talks about five different kinds of horses. There's the, the best horse is the one all you have to do is whisper a whip in its ears, and it'll do what you want it to do. Second one, you actually have to show the whip. Third one, you have to touch its skin with the whip. The fourth, you have to go through the skin a little bit into the flesh. And the fifth is when the whip has to go all the way into the bone before the horse responds. So don't wait around until things really are bad before you say, gee, I've really got to get my act together here. If you simply hear about the dangers, I hear you hear about the whip. Or if you hear about the good things that come with the practice, try to be the sort of person who responds immediately. So your practice will have energy, it will have power. lead to the results that the Buddha promised.